Dude, you want the clap? That's Gonorrhea is gnarly, drip. dude. Are you sure? It's not a sin to get the dick drip, it's a sin to keep it. I had an old man tell me that at the strip club once. It's not a sin to get it, it's a sin to keep it. Keep it. Oh my god. Lower the bar. Wow. What's up? I'm Matt Vincent, two times Highland Game World Champion with one of my favorite people on earth, Dr. Not, Kelly Sturrell. Not Highland Game World Champion, two times. You were very close to a world champion. I, I am married to a world champion. Perfect. But so, turns out there are a lot of surgeries in our family. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of replacement joints. And so that's what we're talking about. So we're talking about post-surgical training and what's gonna be the best option for you. And so of all the tools, all the things that you should buy, what you should do to be staying intact pre-surgery and then coming out of surgery. You have to have it. It's your best tool. You gotta have an arm leg bike. If it's your first purchase, right? Like what else is more important? Hands down, look, one of the things that I think we all obsess about pre-surgery is, well, like, will be strong enough? And I want to shift the narrative a little bit and that I want to be focusing on vasculature and being well perfused. I want well-developed vascular networks so that we can get the garbage out and get the groceries back in. Your strength, how strong are you going to get in the six weeks before surgery? You're not adding any. Right. And if you're already strong, that's going to come back. But you being having really healthy, really, really well perfused tissues that just get a lot of blood, it takes a minute. And that's the thing I want to be working on. Circulation is the game post-surgery. So even post-surgery, like even if you can't use your affected limb. Or, yeah, right. That's the, that's for, and that we could be talking about shoulder. We can talk about elbow, we can talk about wrist, we can talk Anything. about knee, ankle. You have to be able to get the other three limbs going. Unless you've somehow managed to end up in one of these double shoulder things and two straight leg braces, well, you're this gonna, isn't ideal. I'm gonna give you a hand to get going. And one of the reasons that it's important that you can do this is one, you won't go insane. We can keep you metabolically intact. So we can keep your insulin sensitivity up, we can get you enough exercise that you're going to fall asleep. And it doesn't have to be heroic, right? But you no. need some input. And look, we can really shut down the range of motion. We can begin to initiate some aerobic training, which is one of the first things we do afterwards. I need you to clear out all that anesthesia, and I need to get your, your body starting to circulate. And, and one of the problems post-surgery post-surgery training is you just can't move as much as you need to move. Can't. You can't walk, and this is so low impact that on everything else, and if you wanna cook it, like if you wanna post both legs up and get after it with the arms, you can get the heart through the roof. Yeah, so you know, a lot of times what people think is, you know, hey, it's obviously just for three limbs, but it's not. Because what you can do is actually ghost ride the other limb. So you can begin to just get the motion in. So maybe it's 95% with your right arm, and the left arm is just moving a little bit when you're clear to move. Right, or just let it coast. Let that leg just move around. So, you know, one of the things that is so crucial, especially after lower limb injury like knee, is that we just need to be flexing and extending. We so just, that, you can't get. So that was something for sure that this was really valuable for, because. I can move the seat up and down to work on how much range of motion. You can have the seat super high. Yep. And so even here, like I'm almost fully straight leg at the bottom. So this is like full cycling, proper positioning for a bike. And so what's nice is with this, because I have the leverage of my other foot and the other hands, if this leg needs range of motion, I can use the others to slowly work it to end range and then go back. And I did this for the first week after surgery two or three times a day. Yes. And then spend the rest of the time cruising. Georgia, my daughter broke her leg in a cast. We put her cast up, kept her intact. And the research is very clear that if, especially if you train the other limb, it has carryover. Your brain says, oh, well, let's, let's go ahead and juice the other leg too. So what people don't appreciate is that we get neurologic carryover by training the other limbs. So it's not all one or zero. Right, like it's not hey, just unilateral giant leg. <laughs> no, it won't, that won't happen. You're dragging that leg along. Now, a couple things that we find to be very useful as well. Throw on some occlusion bands, some blood flow restriction, and suddenly we have what we call 
even high physiology, low skill, where we can challenge the physiology by making it harder for the blood to get into the limb and exit the limb, triggers all of the signaling that we would get from exercise. Hmm. So it's a really powerful way to, for muscle growth, for vascularization, vascular density, all of the things. We use blood flow restriction all of our surgeries. Post-surgery, even in the hospital with elderly people, we use blood flow restriction training. But now throw it on with this, and in 15 minutes, you don't have very much tissue tolerance, you can't handle very much, but we can get a ton of work done very powerfully. Yeah, and I mean, as far as, I mean, day three after surgery, yep. you can be on this machine. The other thing is, as soon as we start incorporating breath holds, it's another way of making your brain think, we are working at such high intensities that there's no oxygen so how, in the system. So how are you walk, working that in? So there's a couple things you can do really simply on this. Uh, here's, a, here's a couple protocols. One is, I want you to take one breath every five seconds. It's just think of it as like pranayama apneic training. Dynamic okay. apnea is what we're really talking about. So by controlling the breath, we can really force the CO2 tolerance and get, get all of the mechanisms that are sort of endemic to the physiology of challenging with breath holds. So this is like a five second in, five second out? You get one breath every five seconds, however you want to do that, <laughs> okay, right? Perfect. But then conversely, an easy program that we stole right from the French free divers is we take a 10 second inhale at the top of the minute. So the minute hits to zero, you got 10 seconds to take a breath, and then you hold your breath as long as you can. Then as soon as you pop and die, you go and just breathe normally and then start that again. So by putting this breath hold in here, we get a lot of brain training because that fear I'm drowning while I'm on the bike, but we're also making the tissues work at lower CO2 or lower oxygen levels. So it's another way of challenging the tissue without mechanically without challenging the tissue. And that's really the game right now to keep you intact. And what you'll see is that you don't just have to go on and log 40 minutes or 50 minutes. That's great. But there's so many ways where we can do intervals. A basic Tabata interval. Right. But I want you to think, hey, if I have this in my house, and you really should, if you can afford one, get one during your surgery training, on it a couple times a day. That really, like you, you alluded to that, even if it's two or three minutes. Moving, I, I looked at rehab totally different than like, okay, I have an hour of training today. No. I switched immediately to this is a thing I have to chip away at and like three small sessions are great. And that's the equivalent of like, once I can start walking, I'm gonna start getting in three 10 minute walks a day or a 20 minute walk and just start using the body again and bearing weight and doing all this because you, you need it as well. It's single gearing also. And one of the things that we get with the assault bike is it's a, you're pushing a bigger gear. So no one's ever going to be above 60 or 70 RPMs. The last thing that comes back in your training after post-surgery or post-injury is your speed. And one of the things that we, we do is we do want our athletes to be working on speed eventually, but early on you're rate limited by your speed, which is nice. So we don't have to worry about the speed component. The speed is slow enough now where we can actually get some hard work in, but we're not challenging this high rate spinning. Right, idea. which is what's tricky about say the Zwift trainer or any of that coming straight after surgery, because if I'm at a low enough wattage, you know, or, or making the bike easy enough to pedal so that I'm not causing tissue damage, I have to be at a 90 RPM to get anything done. That's right. And I want you to appreciate that when you have this opportunity, yes, there are going to be other aspects of your training, which are going to go by the wayside a little bit, right? You're not going to be as strong or there are positions you're going to have to, because you've, you've just been through a surgery. You've been taken. It's like, you, you'll, it's, you, you'll come you back. You have the tools. But you actually can come out post-surgically more metabolically intact and actually use this to your advantage, where your aerobic power can be much more increased and you can use this as a time very simply to actually become a better athlete in a really simple domain. Again, I'm not swimming, I'm not biking, I'm not running, I'm in this really controlled, high physiology, low skill environment with this very low risk, this is the way to do it. Yeah, I, I love it because like what you're saying, that whole thing, having surgery is a bummer and super sucks. It's gonna be a setback, it's all these things, but you can mentally look at it as this setback that you're you're still trying to work on where you were 
instead of this is an opportunity to dress the foundation of the building so that once we get back up to the penthouse, we have more options. You know, and again, just to reiterate how important, you know, we're always thinking in terms of aerobic power, right? The stairway adaptation, all of these things. Post-surgery, we have interrupted all of the associated vascular networks. So all of the things that bring the garbage in or get, you know, bring the groceries in the garbage out have been interrupted. So when we prioritize, and even in our sort of, when we use the NMES devices, these normal muscular electric stem devices, everything that we're doing is gained at how do we get and evacuate fluid and how do we get movement into the system? Because ultimately what we want, what you want to appreciate is that when we're loading these tissues, we need to get muscle contraction to dump the lymphatic system. Right. And if you don't get enough muscle contraction, you're just using gravity to get the lymph and the swelling to drain out of the system. But all those systems are buried into your quads, hamstrings, and calves. And what I'd want you to do really is like, oh, you just had knee surgery, we're gonna walk 10 to 12, 15,000 steps a day. That's impossible. Right. It's impossible. It so would be great. what's the solution then, right? So the solution is to get as much of that kind of movement in. And even if it's low threshold where you're not breathing hard, you're now pumping, which means you're going to have less swelling, which means you're going to be healing faster. Which is moving. why something like Mark Pro, Power Dot, Compex are such All of those, those are crucial. Great tools. Because you're getting movement without motion. But here, that's right. But here we're actually getting those tissues to be, to be moving and loading. So now we've got the garbage out groceries in, and if we can manage your swelling, we actually see less pain, right. which is a huge deal because that swelling is a big driver of discomfort. So now potentially you're taking less opiates, you're sleeping better, and all we've done is got you to get the muscle contraction to dump lymphatics. And it's such an entourage effect for the whole healing 100%. process because now we're off the drugs, now we're moving more, now we feel better. You start feeling that positive momentum yes. start to carry, and now you're getting out of the woods. You can start to see light at the end of the tunnel post-surgery. Yeah, you know, so when we, when we focus on that, that's an important part. And the other thing is that if you get input into your brain, you're signaling that this is non-threatening, that it's okay to bend my knee. And your brain starts to say, hey, it's okay to bend the knee, let's chill out. So the movement allows us to de-threat to de-escalate the threat of the brain paying attention to this surgical tissue. So movement alone will do that. This is one of the reasons if you've woken up in the night with pain, you're, one of the reasons happening is that you're not moving, so things are congesting. But two, your brain isn't hearing movement because that movement and pain pathways in the brain are very similar pathways. And so what ends up happening is like you see someone hurt themselves and they start moving <coughs> because you can't feel the pain because you're moving, right? So when we get people moving, the brain is now saying, oh, it's okay, look at this non-threat, and you can't hear pain symptoms. So it can be a really powerful analgesic, plus all the other effects we're talking about, plus we can just continue to ramp up. So when it's time to load, you're, we're not starting from a deficit, we're actually starting from a net positive. Yeah, there's, there's so many great options coming out of surgery and little things you can do that really do make Big difference. You gotta have an assault bike. You have to have some yeah, one, echo one bike, you, assault bike. You need y yes, uh, one hundred percent. You need an arm bike, yeah. and you can have one in the neighborhood that you pass around. Doesn't matter. Yeah. I mean, really look at it as the post-surgical post trauma. And what you'll see is that, believe it or not, multiple times you're gonna get broken arms with kids. You're gonna get like you know someone's gonna have a pelvic floor surgery. Like there's so many things that there are uses for this. This is the one of the cornerstones of our post-surgery training. And that's what we all want you to think about. Notice that we're not using the word rehab on purpose. We are training and trying to protect a tissue post-surgery, but we're training. There we go. Get yourself an assault bike if you have a surgery coming up. If you don't have a surgery coming up, it's an incredible tool. It's one of my favorite things I've ever had. I've, I've spent way too many hours on it. Have you? Unfortunately. Is it too many hours? I don't care for it anymore. <laughs> but I still have it and I still use it because there's nothing I can find in a minute that's, that hurts more. That's right. So thank you guys for listening. Check out the Ready State, Dr. Kelly Sturette. Thank you, man. Good.